You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 16. How to help your child develop a healthy relationship with food. On today's episode, I'm interviewing Julie Duffy Dillon, creator of the Love Food Podcast and a registered dietitian, licensed therapist, and mom. She is going to talk with us today about how you can help your child develop a healthy relationship with food and help your child feel good about the body that they live in. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Welcome back to the Nourish Child Podcast. It's your host, Jill Castle. I am so excited to have you here with me today. I'm interviewing Julie Duffy Dillon of the Love Food Podcast. If you haven't uh, listened to that podcast before, I'm sure you will love it as much as I do. And I will be sure to include the link to her show in the show notes, and she will actually describe it a little bit uh, much better than I can to you as I uh, roll out this interview with her. But she today is talking about a very, very important issue, and that is helping our kids develop a healthy relationship with food. That is a major goal for any parent of a child in my mind. We want our kids to have a healthy relationship with food. And what does that mean? We'll dig into more of that later. But one of the things I think it means is being very flexible with all kinds of different foods and not feeling like certain foods are bad for you or going to cause permanent damage to your health or your weight or anything like that. I think it's important that we all think with a flexible mind when it comes to food, and we all have a personal balance that works for ourselves and our families. And while we're striking that balance, which I've, I've discussed before, but while, while we are striking that balance, we are positive, open, and flexible with all kinds of food. So I don't want to hold you for any longer, and I want to dig into this interview with Julie. She shares so much insight from her many, many years of working with patients who have eating disorders, including very young children, and she's gleaned a lot of insight into what is important to consider as we embark on raising our own children so that they do have a healthy relationship with food and that they are cool and okay with who they are and the body that they live in. So without further delay, here's my interview with Julie. Hey, Julie, welcome to the Nourish Child podcast. Hey, Jill. Thank you so much for um, letting me come and talk to you and to your listeners. Well, it's such a treat to have you here. I think uh, my audience is going to be so excited to hear what you have today have to say today because I know that a lot of my listeners and a lot of the parents that uh, listen in and are on my blog and that I work with are always very interested in how to help their children develop a healthy relationship with food and even with their bodies. And I thought you are the perfect person to talk about this. Oh, well, I hope I can uh, explain it in a way that's helpful, but it certainly is a complicated um, kind of process to heal your relationship with food, especially as a parent when you're raising these these little humans <laughs> to yeah. eventually also hopefully have a positive, healthy relationship with food. So I'm going to do my best. Awesome. Awesome. So before we kind of dig into the questions, why don't, if you don't mind, tell us about yourself and all the things that you do. I know you have a wonderful podcast and a private practice and you're just doing a whole bunch of stuff. So let everybody know uh, a little bit more about you. Yeah, well, so I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I'm also trained as a counselor. 
And I combined those two because I was working with um, children and their families and helping them to um, have a healthier kind of way of just experiencing life with food and movement and uh, body image. And what I found is my training as a dietitian helped with the food part and like knowing what to eat, but it really wasn't getting to the core of like how to really help with the dynamics that were going on. So I, I went ahead and kind of combined those two. And over the years, I've come to a place where I have identified myself as someone who is body positive, which means that I help people heal a relationship with food um, in a way that is considered to be weight neutral. So we take the scale out of the equation as a measure of health. And so what happens then is I work with people with lots of different body sizes and um, really helping them to connect with their body's own wisdom to, you know, uh, find ways to eat that are energizing and health promoting, whether it's like lowering blood sugar or cholesterol or increasing energy levels. And we use that as a measure of progress. Mm -hmm. And I've done that for, it's probably, it's almost been 20 years now. And I have a private practice in this little small town in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I have two dietitians that work with me and we are all dietitians working from that same kind of perspective. And, uh, you know, after a while I decided that I wanted to bring this message to more people outside of this little town. Mm -hmm. And so podcasting is what I found is a good way because I can, basically bring the same message that I bring to clients individually or in groups here um, on a podcast. But I really was wondering how I was going to be able to do that um, until I realized I'm like, oh, I can have people write me a letter. And so my podcast is called Love Food and people write a letter to food, kind of like Dear Abby about mm -hmm. their own like complicated relationship with food. And, um, you know, in particular, it may sound kind of funny to write a letter to food, but in the counseling world, we have something called narrative therapy where we help people pers uh, personalize things and then also remove them from the person, which sounds kind of backwards, I think, because I just said that, <laughs> but that's uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, it's a way to kind of bring out the problem and make it external so then people can then um, – find a way to move away from it and so or move away from the, the issue at hand and so by people writing to food um, I get to hear about all their complicated experiences and then me and sometimes a guest we help them find solutions but then at the end um, food writes back with kind of like a, a summary of what are the next best steps and it's um, really it's really neat to see people connecting to it and I'm um, connecting with people all around the world and it's really exciting so um, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of where that's going. So um, besides all of that, I'm also a mother. I feel like that's my primary responsibility. Mm -hmm. I have two children, and they're eight and almost four. Uh, one's a boy and one's a girl. And um, one is biological and one we adopted. So I'm getting to experience all these different parts of, like, raising different kinds of children. And um, I'm really thankful for that. And they get to be my guinea pigs, too, because I'm <laughs> With my way of doing things with food, I get to experiment with it. That's um, right, and they're aware of all that. And <laughs> so, but it's it's a fun. Um, I don't know. I'm having a lot of fun these days with all these different. Um, I don't know things going on. So yeah, yeah. that's about sums it up. I hear you. I hear you. I love that you said you experiment with your kids because I have four of them and they've been my guinea pigs too. And they've really, you know, for me anyway, solidified my thinking about childhood nutrition. I've experimented on them. It works. They're great normal eaters and, and seem to have, you know, a good relationship with food and themselves. And, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's great to know all the science and the research, which I think, you know, I can safely say you and I both do, but to put it into practice and see it really unfold and work is extremely rewarding. It is, but and it also um, being a parent humanized it for me too, because mm -hmm. I practiced for a long time before I was a parent. And I can remember holding my newborn, my first child and, and uh, really being like, Oh, no, how am I going to do this? And, and in particular, the transition to solid foods was the thing that I remember just feeling really doubtful about. Mm -hmm. And which was funny because that's something that I worked with with clients for years. But I found myself rereading Ellen Satter and mm -hmm. um, just feeling really um, not secure in what I was going to do. And I feel like that's just the human experience. You know, we doubt ourselves and sure. um, we need to trust ourselves in order to like, per, you know, allow our children to do the same for themselves. So exactly. it's really more complicated and um, 
not at the same time. <laughs> right, <So. clears throat> right, right, right. Simple yet not easy is mm-hmm. what I like to say. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't want to get uh, too political or anything on this podcast. I want to really stay neutral politically, but I cannot help but notice in the media today, there is so much coverage of body weight, body image, uh, body positivity, body shaming. What do you what do you think of all of this? Um, well, I feel like um, to me, it's a social justice issue. So I guess it is political at some point. But the thing that's really interesting is if you think of politics as right and left or Republican, Democrat or liberal or, or conservative, I feel like people on every kind of side um, have there seems to be a belief system in that um, promoting weight loss, the pursuit of weight loss. Um, is the thing that's going to promote health more than anything else, and and almost like if if someone is um, larger, it doesn't really matter how they're eating or how they're moving. That that means that they're not in a healthy place. Mm-hmm. And I think the message also is that we get a picture of what we're supposed to look like, which is you know genetically really not how most of us are going to look, and we have to fight really hard to look like that. And so we have this really narrow. Um, goal that most of us just are not going to be able to attain and we have to diet to do it. And unfortunately, we know diets don't work. You know, it's just a matter of time. And so mm-hmm. we people regain the weight. That's kind of like what research is looking at now. It's not whether or not diets work. It's whether or not or how long the weight suppression can go on <laughs> before right. it comes back. And, mm-hmm. and, and I feel like it stinks because um, – I don't think that message has really gotten to a place where people in their heart believe it because I still think there's a personalization of like, oh, I did it wrong. That's right. why I'm not the, the thin ideal. So therefore, there's also this kind of belief that I'm not acceptable until I'm at that place. And that's um, then that, that 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 leads to this, this kind of uh, toxic environment, especially for children who are going to be in larger bodies. I And something I'll just note to your listeners is I also use the word fat in a way that is completely neutral as a descriptor. And I do it intentionally, but I appreciate sometimes people use it in like a pejorative way. And I don't, mm-hmm. and that's not the way I'm using it. So sometimes I use the word large and sometimes I use the word fat, but in case that it's kind of shocking, sometimes it's meant to be, but also I'm trying to retrain my brain as well to think of fat as more of a neutral descriptor mm-hmm. and training my uh, and, tr- and helping my children also to um, think of fat in that way. So I do think fat children are the ones that um, I worry the most in this toxic world because there have always been fat children mm-hmm. and there always will be. And so um, trying to remove all of them or making all of them feel so ashamed for being just what who they're genetically supposed to be, I think is just... Um, something that was really detrimental and it does things like uh, promote uh, this negative body image that becomes quite distracting so kids can't focus in school you know right. they're worried about how do I look or mm-hmm. how much do I weigh instead of like oh I need to study for my math test you know right or, um, I want to meet make new friends you know things that kids are supposed to be doing in school to better themselves they're thinking um almost like a selfie kind of thing like how do i look Mm -hmm. instead of who am i Mm -hmm. so these are really long-term detrimental outcomes from this thin ideal or this diet kind of culture that may seem kind of surfacey but again i feel like it is really um it's really hurting us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a, I have a client that I've been working with for a very long time, and a uh, little boy, and he's he's a big, large boy, and genetically so. And it, it's so, you know, he's done so well, has all the lifestyle behaviors in place that he needs to have. He eats very, you know, well. He's active. He sleeps well. All the all the ingredients it takes to. Uh, be a healthy kid no matter what your size is. And it's so discouraging to me when he goes to other healthcare providers and they focus on his weight. They'll say, oh, you're, you know, you're still, you're still heavy. You're still above the 95th percentile for weight. You're still this, you're still that. I think you should go to an endocrinologist, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting here running counter product, you know, counter uh, messaging that with the family saying, but everything we've been doing for years, I mean, there's nothing more we're gonna do. 
there is nothing more. We've got everything in place. He mm-hmm. he hasn't accelerated his weight gain. He hasn't, you know, he's just stayed steady. And um, it's so discouraging when, you know, there are um, other healthcare providers out there. Not only are we trying to send this message uh, to families and, and, and your message, you know, that, that health can be had no matter what your size is, um, it's discouraging when not everyone out there is on the same page. Yes. Yeah. And I feel like the the healthcare providers you're speaking about are really the normal people right now. I mean, I feel like that's the most common reaction to someone in a fat body is like, we need to fix this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working with people, you know, and I'm, I'm not in a fat body. I've always genetically been smaller. And so um, something that I have had the privilege of is being able to listen to clients for years now who've always lived in fat bodies and what their experience is like and um, and then raising children also that are going to be fat adults you know that what that is like and what we need to do to really advocate for them or help them advocate for themselves and also advocate for these clients and um, you know I'm really happy that the American Academy of Pediatrics released new guidelines for um, how to talk about health and weight and food mm-hmm. with children and to take the weight out of the conversation. Yeah. You know, um, I can remember many years ago, um, I think it was, I think it was my daughter, but there was a conversation that started to happen in the office where they started to, to mention that her BMI was getting, um, uh, to a part, a place over her weight. And I like put my hand up and I was like, you know, <laughs> This is just not a conversation that I found I find health promoting for me and my family, mm-hmm. and um, and I was just like, what, what? No, the, my child, you haven't even asked her how she's eating, how she's exercising. You know, this is not something that um, I think should be like attended to just like that with with making assumptions. And I don't really feel like it takes much more time to like just ask, oh, how are you eating? <laughs> you know, right? How are you moving? Right. And I think we can get much more information about a person's health that way than their weight. Absolutely. And I think I think sometimes what gets missed is that, you know, even if 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 somebody is if if a child is living in a fat body and there is other evidence where that fat body is hurting their internal organs, you know, be it blood work or whatever, um, you still don't have to put that child on a diet. It's just Mm -hmm. basic, healthy, routine, systematic eating and and. you know, a balance of foods that children really need to eat and like to eat and and just finding that that sweet spot where everybody can live happily (laughs) and healthfully. Right. And I think that's where weight stigma hurts everyone because children who are not in fat bodies, I don't think people are really wondering how they're eating because like, oh, they're fine. Right. (laughs) They're not in a fat body. And then children who are in fat bodies, assuming that they're not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. And so um, I think something I always keep in mind is we can't tell a person's health by looking at them. And so when we do that, we are missing the mark. And so that's something that I encourage any healthcare provider to consider is just, you know, everybody, everyone can be educated on healthy eating and healthy movement. And it's not just for people who are big. You right. know, it's it's not just for them. Everybody needs to have fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And and yes, we cannot make assumptions based on the way somebody mm-hmm. looks. Now, you know, as children grow up and this is one of the questions or one of the concerns rather that I hear from some of the clients that I work with personally, but also, you know, on my blog or in, you know, when I engage with the public, is that parents are really worried about their children, not only their children eating healthy, that's a big worry for a lot of parents, but they're now, I'm noticing over the last few years, there's a growing worry about developing a healthy relationship with food, that that's a real uh becoming a real pain point for parents. They fear that their child isn't uh, developing that healthy relationship with food. So what advice would you give or insight or um, experiences could you share uh, about, about helping children develop that healthy relationship with food? So I share the parent's concern. Um, I think 
there is too much talk on um, an obesity epidemic. And I think the thing that I hear the most is that fear of like things like type 2 diabetes and the kind of belief that eating disorders are really rare. And, you know, something that I, I've been able to gather in research is in a population size of 100,000 children, there are 12 with type 2 diabetes, but 2,900 children affected by an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's something that is really even more <laughs> concerning than type 2 diabetes. Right. Um, and so what I encourage clients, uh, clients and parents or anybody who's concerned about their child's relationship with food is to make sure you do um, untangle food and weight because again, um, you know, it's not just fat children that need to be told to eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, so making sure you do distinguish between that. And then, you know, I think there's, it's really important to acknowledge how are you relating to food because modeling is the, the way we teach children, right? So mm -hmm. more than anything that we say, it's what we're doing. And so are you commenting on your body and how much you don't like it? Are you saying you feel guilty for eating something? You know, is your relationship with food in a place that's flexible and not rigid? And I think that's a really important place to start. And from there, you know, I feel like a parenting responsibility is to make sure you provide a variety of food, which mm -hmm. includes those foods that we often associate as very healthy and then also food that's fun, you know, having... Uh, making sure there's no forbidden food unless it's like, you know, an allergen of some sort. But um, besides that, making sure there's no forbidden foods and, you know, finding a way to um, provide in a, in a way that's very much encouraging uh, variety. But, um, you know, I always think of the Ellen Satter kind of feeding responsibility where you, mm -hmm. um, as a parent, I always think I'm like, I'm in charge of what the choices are and what time they eat and what it also the environment is like at mealtime and my child gets to decide how much if at all and really learning to be okay with that even if there's times where I'm like oh my goodness <laughs> are they gonna stop eating or oh my are they ever gonna eat again you know mm -hmm. we have to just kind of trust that their body's gonna take care of themselves just like I, I trust that they can breathe and you know take care of urination and things like that right. like their body can take care of it as long as I just provide what they need to make it happen. And um, I think it's really, unfortunately, too common for discussions about foods being bad and mm -hmm. um, kind of a moralistic kind of discussion on foods. And I was very protective of my children's transition to school. And I can still remember the first time when my daughter, my older child, coming home and saying, you know, so-and-so said this food was bad. And it was like, she was coming to me like, mommy, you haven't taught me this. What, what, what's, and she knows I'm a dietitian. Right. And I'm like, oh, geez, what do I do with this now? Um, and I think uh, having that kind of um, dichotomy or that kind of good, bad kind of discussion around children is really detrimental to them on more levels just than food mm -hmm. because they don't have the ability until they're at least 13 to do abstract thinking. Right. And, you know, thinking of food in moderation is a very abstract concept. And so, you know, a, a four and five or six year old, they, when they hear eating French fries is bad, they're going to think that means it's like when I hit my brother, mm -hmm. I'm bad, you know? And so, right. um, that, and honestly, my youngest clients are seven years old with eating disorders and with anorexia. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how it develops for them is a, they have a little bit more anxiety than most kids and maybe a tad bit of OCD. But then when someone tells them eating a certain food is bad, they're going to follow that. Right. And then an eating disorder is born. So, um, you know, what a parent can do then is making sure that the talk about food is really neutral or positive. Right. And that, you know, I think you said this or I heard somewhere else that all food is legit. It's all legal. It's it's there's nothing bad. It's just it's that balance that you strike. And I think that's where parents struggle so much is they might get that balance uh, well honed inside the home, but then outside of the home, they're dealing with all these other, you know, situations that make it difficult. And that's where the whole education piece and, and keeping things, you know, giving children the tools to make decisions and um, be flexible, be really flexible mm -hmm. with food. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think as a parent, we have to think a lot about um, okay, so they're going to a birthday party this weekend, so they're going to have pizza and cupcakes, and then they're going to buy hot lunch at school one day next week, and so that's when they're going to get chips and stuff like that. And, and so we have to kind of find a way to balance 
their choices, you know, mm-hmm. and I think what's important for us to be able to do with that is to keep in mind that, especially for kids, because when they eat a food that is fun, you can tell they're getting so much pleasure out of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and oh, and yeah. that can feel kind of weird to us, you know, because mm-hmm. it's like, that's something culturally that we've been taught that is not okay. But healthy eating includes pleasure. Mm-hmm. So um, making sure that that is a part of it. And, and then also being okay with boundaries, you know, if, um, you know, if a kid is getting a lot of food that is more kind of fun in a certain period of time, and if you're like, well, these, I just don't want to offer that as a choice for the next meal, it's okay to do that, you right. know, and being more comfortable with that kind of boundary, but not in a way of like, you can't have it because you've had too much sugar. I right. would never tell my child that. It's just, no, it's just not a choice. Right. And you don't have to go any deeper into it. Right. I like to say, it's not on the menu today. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I like that. Yeah, because I, I need a new thing to say because I feel like on repeat I say it's just not a choice right now. Right. It's just not a right. choice right now. Like it's this, this the uh, repeating record. So I like that. I'm going to have to take that one for well, a while to teach it up. <laughs> I know. I try, I try to figure out many different ways to imply no without saying no. So that that is uh, – I think really key for kids because no gets to be really old over time. And when it's attached to food, then, you know, it's, it's like reverse psychology. The stuff right. you can't have is the stuff you really want. Of course. Cause if you take a child into a room full of toys and you tell them to play with any toy you want, except for this dirty, smelly, gross sock, what are they going to want to play with? <laughs> the gross sock. <laughs> um, and I think like having just a simple statement that you can rely on, like it's just not on the not on the menu today. Um, it's telling them just what they need to know. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many concepts that we have with with parenting where we do that. You know, they don't need to know everything because their brain is just not ready for that information. And I feel like food is like that. It's a very complex, abstract um, concept that I feel like even as adults we grapple with. So right, right. how can we expect our five year old to get a- it? Absolutely, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you on that one. Um, so we know that, you know, children, regardless of what their size or shape or their weight is, uh, big kids, smaller kids, they all can have, uh, struggles with feeling good about themselves. Part of it's developmental, part of it can be their, uh, body image or their, their outward presence in the world in terms of their body, um, but it is it can be challenging for them to feel good about themselves in today's world and certainly there are long term implications of not feeling good about oneself in the world what what do you see as those sort of long term implications what what comes from a childhood and a child in a childhood who doesn't feel good about themselves their body in the world today what what are we looking at long term so um the majority of my career has been spent working with people in the throes of an eating disorder. You know, mm-hmm. that's where I mostly am. I'm sitting with clients in that place, and they've given me the opportunity to learn what it's like before it happens. And I've I've noticed that there's three key components to an eating disorder, um, and one of them is a genetic side. You mm-hmm. know, there's some kind of genetic predisposition. And um, another one is some kind of change in their eating habits, which for a lot of people is a diet. Um, And then the other one is body dissatisfaction. And so something we know to be true is kids who go through puberty really early or really late, you know, just somehow different from their peers, they're at higher risk for this body dissatisfaction. Um, And so I think we need to be aware of that. And... uh, I think it's really normal as adults to kind of point out, oh, wow, you're getting so big or you're growing. And and there gets to be a point where kids will not really like that information anymore or they were not going to benefit from it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so really as a a grown-up, finding a way to communicate your happiness with seeing a child besides noticing their body um, or how they look, um, you know, and, and really noticing things about them as a a person or what they're, you know, if they like to sing or dance or, you know, just any other kind of quality besides that, I think is something that can help prevent that body dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. And then um, as healthcare providers, it's also acknowledging, you know, that whole like, you know, weight is not necessarily indicating health. And and, and as I like a culture, really getting that in our hearts, you know, really believing that. Mm -hmm. So then um, there's more acceptance of that different 
body size. And, you know, kids are smarter than we give them credit for. I think uh, they realize before they have the words for it that fat is a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. And then and then it kind of comes down to looking different as a bad thing. Right. And, um, you know, I feel like this goes not just for body size, but it can also be, cut, be from looking different or having a different ability or being a different ethnicity. You know, I feel like anyone who may be somewhat different is at higher risk during puberty to have this body dissatisfaction and we need to protect them and find out, you know, a way to, to boost them up and, mm -hmm. ex you know, learn more about themselves and what they excel at and help them, you know, find that path to protect them mm -hmm. as they go through that process. I'm, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and one other thing I'd say too, and the reason why I'm so, you know, I not only eating disorder has been my career, but I also know they have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. So, you know, preventing this body dissatisfaction is something that can literally save lives. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So because you do work with patients in the throes of an eating disorder, have any of them shed light on what they wish would have been handled differently as a child uh, regarding weight or food or just general interactions around their body? Yes. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> yeah. um, and it, I, it's something that I, I'm really conscious of is even like com my confidentiality with clients. But something that I know is like I hear I've heard for years now and over and over again. So I feel safe enough to say it, that there are some some things that we can be aware of and we can learn from their experiences. And one is to not feed a child differently based on their size, mm. you know, um, or based on their gender um, you know, sometimes a girl will be given less because boys just need more, mm -hmm. um, or the fat child will be given a different um, food than the other children. And it just has deeper implications than just like, I can't, I'm sad I can't eat that or eat what they're eating. Right. Um, it becomes like a worth issue and a self concept issue. And then the other one is also, um, words of endearment sometimes people use that are kind of silly yes. about a person's body. Um, yes. You know, I know a lot of people will talk about their fathers or men in their life when they're growing up will make comments about their body and they don't mean it in a way that's harmful, but they'll call them, you know, little piggy or, you know, just mm -hmm. some kind of word that probably they had no intent to be um, harmful, but it became something that was really hard to, to remove from their psyche. Right. Um, so that's, that's one of those things. I, I feel like those are the two big things that um, they've taught me. Oh, and another one is um, um, not having a forbidden food at home. So if a, if a parent does say, you know, we, we can't have that here because it's too much sugar in it. Um, and then a client will talk about, you know, either years later or months later or something, they'll get their hands on it and it'll be really hard to stop eating it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll get caught and they'll get punished and it becomes this like cycle of, of, um, uh, binging, hoarding, and then shame mm -hmm. with, with this food. And then, um, kind of a, a disordered eating with, um, a disordered relationship with food starts to, um, just really become secure in their life. Right, right. So I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't want my, I don't want our listeners or my listeners to think that, you know, their child, if, ha if, if, if they're, you know, binging on something up in their bedroom and hiding stuff under the bed, that they're necessarily going to develop an eating disorder. That's not the case. There, there's, you know, other things that go into the big picture, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. You know, and I think the important thing is all how we react on it, you know, because not everyone is going to um, go on a diet and get an eating disorder. You know, not everyone is going to um, sneak food and hide it in the room and experience this kind of cycle. But one thing we just don't know is someone's genetics. You know, I feel mm -hmm. like a generation ago, we didn't talk about this kind of stuff. So we don't even know what's in our family history, really. Right. So, um, so whenever I feel like it's a pretty common experience for kids to um, – sneak food. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think it's abnormal. No, nope, I agree. I think, yeah. I mean, I feel like every kid's going to do that. Um, and so far how I've reacted and what I've encouraged clients to do with their children is just to like, not get mad, you know, just like, I, I have a rule where we eat, we eat in the kitchen or dining room. And so I, I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, just next time eat in the kitchen or dining room right. or, um, and then also if I notice it happening more often, I wonder, Oh, I wonder if I'm serving enough of this food mm -hmm. or I wonder if I'm serving them enough food. 
do I need to provide more food at meals or, you know, right. I, I, sometimes it's part of something else mm-hmm. and um, it can be a nice cue just that we need to change things up a, a bit. But um, I certainly wouldn't think it's a um, sneaking food as an abnormal thing because our kids are going to express their growing independence yep. through their food. It's just, it's a behavior that is so normal and we make over 200 food decisions a day. So mm-hmm. they're going to express their autonomy through that those decisions too. <laughs> just like most definitely. Ones. Yeah, most definitely. Easiest thing for a child to control, right? Right. And I feel like that's why it's important to let your child choose other things to express themselves too. You know, I, um, I feel like instead of trying to control how much they eat, you know, why don't you let them decide how they can cut their hair? <laughs> like, right. You know, have them express the time in so many other ways. They don't have to do as much with their food. And when they do with the food, it's not necessarily pathological. You know, it's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a really more to just to be aware how we react to when we notice it, I think is really important. Yeah, I, I think a lot of just very neutral sort of reactions about food and weight, shape, size, what's going on with other people and their body. Uh, neutral reaction really can carry you through a lot of those difficult situations. The emotions really charge things and can certainly, you know, kids are sensitive to their parents' emotions, for sure. Right. And I, I always think about, um, I think it's important for us to also acknowledge for your listeners, too, is that we don't have to be perfect at it. You know, um, I always think about for myself, I'm like, I don't have to be perfect parent. I just have to be good enough. And sometimes I'm going to lose my cool. Sometimes I'm going to get all emotional and I'm going to mess up and that's okay. And I think the more I feel bad about it, the worse it would be anyway. So Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just as long as most of the time that we are able to do that with the food, it's going to be good enough as well. It's more when it's always an issue that that's when people have pointed to me. That's been the foundation for their eating disorder. Right, right. Okay, so let's let's just sort of summarize. If you had three pointers or three tips to give to parents on helping their children, you know, feel good about the body they're in and develop a healthy relationship with food, what what would those top three tips be? So the first one is I think it's important to help kids to learn how to honor and respect their body. Um, in particular, I feel like the abdomen, you know, the stomach area is a point of contention for a lot of people in our culture and mm-hmm. just people are don't like how big their tummy is. And tummies come in all different kinds of sizes. And something that I um, encourage people to do is even, you know, whenever, especially when kids are really young, you know, when they're three and four and they'll talk about their tummy and they'll be like, my tummy's so big. And, and they're meeting it in such a nice neutral way. You know, it's just like acknowledging their body part. Mm -hmm. And something that I remember doing is, is, um, saying, well, you know, tell your tummy, thank you for holding your energy today. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. It holds your energy. And how wonderful is that? And, um, And then, you know, any other kind of body things that they may notice, like, wow, you could pick that up. That's, you're really strong, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, acknowledging bodies and their, um, what they they can do. And, um, and also acknowledging that, um, you know, with other people that sometimes bodies can do things and cannot, and that doesn't make them any, you know, less. Mm -hmm. Um, And another thing that I think is important um, is to encourage the mindset and the kind of the belief system that when we feed our body lots of different kinds of food and the amounts that it tells that it needs, then our body is going to like our body weight or our body is just going to be the size it needs to be, you know, mm-hmm. like let nature take its course and just let nature be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just part of genetics and however else you want to de- describe, you know, whether it's um, this is how God made your body and this is just the way it's going to be. And that's really beautiful. Um, and I, I feel it's really important just to encourage kids to just trust that own, their own innate wisdom. Because mm-hmm. I think when kids are aware of hunger and fullness cues and feeling satisfied with meals when they're in touch with that, that's something that research has suggested promotes long-term healthy body image Definitely. because it's, it's like autonomy, you know, like mm-hmm. my body can do this on its own. Right. Um, and then, you know, the other one is, um, for kids to really just trust, um, that whole process and to trust their bodies are going to be where they need to be. And when they see other people, 
it's the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. that, to not automatically make those assumptions mm-hmm. that, you know, there's something wrong with someone else if their body looks different than theirs, that that's just how they were, they were made. Um, and one thing that's really um, helped us in our family is we have always had um, greyhounds. That's a type of dog we just mm-hmm. naturally have at our house. And greyhounds, right. of course, are very, very lean and skinny. They have like 4% body fat and, you know, they're... Mm-hmm. They sleep a lot. <laughs> just always, um, Is there a correlation there? <laughs> I don't know. They just uh, they sleep like 18 hours a day, which makes them easy to take care of. Oh, but wow. of course, they they can run really fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's just how their body's made, you know. That, and, but when you compare them to other dogs, um, you know, I, I, I feel like uh, I have a neighbor who has this little tiny mutt dog that um, I don't even know what, a, what kind of dog it is. Kind of like a hound mix of some sort, but it's it's just it's designed to be different, you know, it's not mm-hmm. meant to go 45 miles an hour like the Greyhound is. And it, that doesn't mean it should be smaller like the Greyhound is and taller. It's just, that's just what it's supposed to be. So it's been a nice like talking point because we can, I think relating it to animals is a good way because, you know, yeah, definitely. It takes it off the person instead. And so people are just the same way. Yeah, I love that. I love that analogy to animals. It makes so much sense. So where can people find you, Julie? I know they're going to want to find you after this podcast. So where can they come and find you? Well, I would welcome them with open arms for sure. And the easiest way to find me is on my website. It's juliedillonrd.com. And then uh, if you are interested in listening to another podcast, of course, Love Food, you just search that in the little search option in iTunes. You can find me there or any other way that you like to listen to your podcast. You can find me too. Awesome. You have a great podcast. I love it. And I'm so glad that you were here on the show today. You have such great wisdom and insight. I think a lot of parents and even healthcare providers are going to just be so delighted to hear what you have to say about this. Thank you so much, Jill. It's such a great time talking to you. And um, I'm glad that we could share some of these things that we've been working with for a number of years. And hopefully it'll help more people to have a healthier relationship with food. Most definitely. Thanks, Julie. Well, that was a great interview. I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed interviewing Julie. She's so insightful and had so many good ideas and things to think about. Don't forget to head over and get the show notes at jillcastle.com forward slash 016. That's 016 for episode number 16. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are a few things you can do to help the Nourish Child podcast grow. You can write a review on iTunes. You can find my show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. And or you can share the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, Wherever you hang out, letting your peers know about the Nourish Child podcast will help them know about the show, but also become more informed and better at nourishing their child. As always, thanks for joining me today. I am so, so glad you were here. Please be sure to give the child in your life, big or small, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out. <laughs>